Hello everyone, I'm Tripti Vashisht. Today I'm going to be presenting on nutrient uptake in Huang Longbing tolerant uh, rootstocks and comparing it to the susceptible rootstocks. This work was done by my student Lucian Gimire uh, for, as a part of her master's thesis and Dr. Jude Grosser, he's our citrus rootstock breeder here at UF. He is a collaborator in this study. So citrus production in the United States, there are three main areas where citrus is produced, uh, California, Texas, and Florida. I'm here in Florida. Florida primarily produces sweet oranges for juice processing. And then there is some production in Arizona as well, uh, mostly lemons. So you might have heard in past few years, uh, the or actually about 15 years now, the citrus production is continuously declining. This solid line shows the production for the entire United States and the dotted line is for Florida. And you will see whatever the pattern is for the entire state, that's the same pattern for Florida, suggesting that Florida is one of the major contributors to United States citrus production. So like I said, we are the largest sweet orange producer and it's about a $9 million industry. So really important um, and it employs a lot of people. So it's really important for the state. This map here is for the Florida state. The star shows where Citrus Research and Education Center is. That's where I am. All these colored areas are the counties that produce citrus. This county where the star is, that's one of the highest producing counties. So the Center for Citrus Research and Education Center is literally uh, in middle of the citrus producing belt. In last 15 years, the production has decreased by 70%. So that's quite alarming. And it's primarily because of Huang Longbing or citrus screening. So citrus greening was first found in Florida in 2005. It is a bacterial disease. Um, bacteria is Candidatus libericter asiaticus, and it is spread by a vector. It's an insect vector disease, Asian citrus psyllid. And you can see this um, insect is really tiny. And when it feeds on the tree, it transmits the bacteria, the tree gets infected. Currently, we have close to 100% infection. So every county, every grove pretty much has HLV. So again, this is the map of Florida with all the citrus producing regions. And this was the map drawn uh, in 2009. So four years after the disease was detected and you can see every single county that produces citrus has HLV. So it spread in about four years. That was quite dramatic. Sweet orange and grapefruit are highly susceptible and these are the two main citrus that we grow here. So some of the symptoms of HLV include shoot dieback, leaf blotchy mottle, poor quality fruit, lots of fruit drop, root dieback, and reduced yield, of course. Here is a photograph for your comparison. This citrus Valencia tree is from California and this is from Florida. So the effect is quite dramatic. So before I, I get into the research, I want to show you what we think happens. So we have a citrus tree under normal condition. It photosynthesizes, produces carbohydrate and uh, these carbohydrates are translocated to the fruit and to the root. Sorry about that. When the Asian citrus psyllid feeds on the tree, it transmits the bacteria. This bacteria thrives in the phloem. The phloem plugging starts happening. As a result, there's a lot, uh, the carbohydrate translocation disrupts. There is root loss happening. There's shoot loss happening. With the root loss, the water and nutrient uptake reduces. Fruit quality drops, overall the tree declines and uh, it becomes unproductive. Currently, there is no cure for HLB. 
What we do know is vector control can be helpful, which is basically using insecticides to control the bacteria, uh, to control the insect. And then in the last few years, there have been lots of reports about intensive mineral nutrition management for HLB trees. Uh, it seems to be working. And one thing is that uh, these trees do have small root systems. So having good nutrition would help. Um, here you can see photograph of a HLB tree, greenhouse tree, and a healthy tree. You can see the differences in the root mass, in the shoot mass, HLB tree showing more nutrient deficiencies than the healthy tree. And this graph here shows that root to shoot ratio is uh, significantly lower in HLB trees. Also, there have been studies uh, that show uh, that the HLB trees have higher nutrient requirement. So these graphs are showing the leaf nutrient concentration of all uh, of nine mineral nutrients. And these red squared boxes is what is highlighting that if you see the HLB plants, HLB plants always have lower concentration of these nutrients than the healthy plant. Um, especially if you do not fertilize the healthy plant and HLB plant at the same time in these graphs that is indicated by NF, HLB plants show more deficiency than the healthy plant suggesting that in due to the presence of disease, somehow these nutrients are being metabolized at a higher rate or are just not taken up by the plant. So altogether higher nutrient requirement. On the other hand, we don't have any germplasm that is resistant to HLB. However, in the last few years, there have been number of uh, new rootstocks introduced that show the potential to tolerate HLB better. Uh, why more rootstocks? Because acceptability of rootstocks is somewhat higher then actually uh, adopting a new scion. So rootstock uh, breeding have, holds more potential than scion breeding. However, there is no specific information on what makes uh, information available on what makes a rootstock more tolerant. So what is making it more tolerant? Also, we have no information on does better nutrient uptake makes a HLB results in more HLB tolerant rootstock. So there is a lot of gap. Now, um, if we have HLB tolerant rootstocks that do show higher nutrient uptake potential, they would make really good combination because that will ease fertilization, fertilizer management. Growers don't have to do the intensive management. Also, if we know the nutrient uptake requirements of certain rootstocks, if they are tolerant, then we can fertilize, uh, we can customize the fertilizer program for that. Therefore, um, you can exploit the full potential of a tolerant tree along with the nutrient uptake. So with that in mind, we started this study. Um, the goal of this study uh, was to, um, study the nutrient uptake in HLB tolerant rootstocks and to investigate differences in the nutrient uptake capacity of different rootstocks. Um, for that, we use six rootstocks. Swingle is our commercial standard. It is the HLB susceptible rootstock. And then we used US 896, which is another HLB susceptible rootstock, and it's known to be not a great performer. Then we had four rootstocks, UFR4 and UFR17, bred in, you know, all these four rootstocks are actually bred in University of Florida. UFR4 and UFR17 are becoming very popular rootstock in last few years and the bird wood data from the nurseries that we collect shows that these are very popular rootstock currently and they both are reported to have good performance under HLB condition and these numbered rootstocks are also known to be good performer a volk which has a volkmer lemon in its background this has been showing 
good if a tolerance to HLB and is uh, quite vigorous in growth. So making it a good candidate. And some studies done previously on HLB have shown it to be a good candidate. So the experimental setup, we first um, used the rootstocks of similar age. So these were the liners of similar age and the rootstocks were deprived of any nutrient for two months. Then we set up a hydroponic system. Um, this here is a photograph of the setup. We let the tr uh, trees acclimatize for one week. Then we added Hoagland solution, which is our fertilizer solution in this case, at the beginning of the experiment. Now, why hydroponic? Because of the two reasons. Well, with hydroponic, we can account for all the nutrients. We know what we are putting in the basket and what we are uh, ending up with. Also with hydroponic, there was no leaching. So complete accountability of the nutrients, making it a very suitable system for steady nutrient uptake. We collected different uh, data, biomass, chlorophyll, pH of the growing media, nutrient analysis of the growing media, leaf shoot, uh, stem nutrient analysis. We also calculated nutrient uptake efficiency of the rootstock. So why nutrient uptake efficiency? It was to account for the possible variation in nutrient uptake due to differences in the root biomass. And the way we calculated was uh, the total amount of nutrient absorbed divided by the root biomass. So we get milligram of nutrient per gram of root mass. So the nutrient efficiency is literally per gram of root. And then we did a gene expression analysis, um, used Swingle as our standard. And we looked at these six genes, which are mostly involved in the zinc, manganese, iron, and calcium uptake, man calcium and magnesium uptake. We used these genes that were specific to secondary and micronutrients because we do know that HLB trees show differences in the uh, uh, metabolism of uh, secondary macronutrients and micronutrients. So talking about the results, first and foremost, the biomass. Um, what you're seeing is on the x-axis are the different rootstock and y-axis are the different variables that we measured. So leaf dry weight and to drive it, we did find that AVOLC had the highest biomass out of all the rootstock and the other five were pretty much the same. We also measured the growing media pH because we wanted to see what, what do these rootstock do. Uh, and we found that AVOLC was actually increasing the growing media pH more than any other rootstock. Um, so AVOLC has more pH adjusting capacity than others. When we look at the mineral nutrient uptake, so now in these charts, what you're seeing are the different rootstocks and then each cell is a nutrient. So, so we split it into two parts, day zero to day 15, and second is from day 15 to day 30. And this is what the trees absorbed. The, so, what we found is that most of the manganese uptake happens in the first 15 days of the nutrient availability in most of the rootstocks, whereas other nutrients are absorbed in 15 to 30 days time period. AVOLC showed the highest nutrient uptake out of all the rootstocks. So it was significantly higher in taking up nutrient uh, then all the rootstocks. And then 896 showed the lowest nutrient uptake. So basically whatever were the nutrients on day zero, the nutrients were about the same on day 30, except for phosphorus and manganese. And actually where all the rootstocks were absorbing manganese on day 15, 896 was absorbing on uh, day 15 to 30 time period. So really slow in nutrient uptake. Um, here is the photo uh, image of the root biomass chart again. AVOLC had the highest. So uh, yes, it is absorbing more nutrients, but then all the others which had about the same um, biomass showed differences in the nutrient uptake. So it's just not the biomass 
that affects the nutrient uptake. When we looked at the nutrient uptake efficiency per gram of root, uh, we found that only three nutrients were uh, different in the new efficiency, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. And interestingly, in all of these nutrients, AVOLT showed the highest uptake and UFR showed the poorest uptake. UFR4 showed the poorest uptake and then 896 had the poorest uptake for phosphorus as well. Um, so it's interesting that they are following that pattern and even at the per gram level, it's the same. In this graph or in this chart, we are seeing the leaf nutrient accumulation and uh, here these two colored Columns are for the root biomass and leaf biomass, just to remind you what they look like. They are arranged lowest to the highest. Interestingly, we saw that UFR4 had a good accumulation for NPK, but it was really poor for magnesium, for most of the secondary macronutrients and micronutrients. So altogether, having higher biomass doesn't mean you will have higher accumulation of the nutrients. So a volk really doesn't, is not on the top for anything. It is also possible that because AVOLC has more um, root density and leaves, probably the nutrients are more uh, distributed or you can say diluted. That is one of the possibilities. When we looked at the gene expression of the six genes, uh, on day zero, all the genes were pretty much same. Here we are looking at the ZIP5 expression. And we found that on day 30, after the Hoagland solution application. Swingle had the lowest expression of ZIP5 suggesting a poor uptake. To remind you what the uptake looked like, Swingle did have, did not show a significant uptake of the zinc. For iron, we saw 896 to have the poor uptake. And again, to remind you, 896 was actually, uh, was one of the poorest uptaker or uptaker of the iron. So altogether to conclude, we are seeing that AVOLC has the highest uptake efficiency, uptake efficiency and potential for the rootstocks and US 896 has the weakest. UFR4 also shows a poor uptake, but it has a lot of root mass, which compensates for the nutrient uptake. So at per gram level, UFR4 is pretty bad, but because of a higher biomass, it makes up for it. Swingle is showing that it has zinc issues and possibly that is resulting into HLB suscept contributing to HLB susceptibility. There are links between zinc and HLB susceptibility. So if somebody has a swingle rootstock already in their groves, probably uh, focusing on zinc would be a good idea. And um, overall rootstocks um, with high biomass can still have poor nutrient efficiency. So um, that said having growing more root is not important actually growing good quality root is the important thing so selecting the root stocks with good quality is important uh, with that i would like to conclude my presentation thank you uh, thank you organizers for giving me this opportunity thanks